Today I'm hanging out at Steamboat Lake, which is at the base of one of the most iconic peaks in all of Colorado, Hans Peak. Even cooler than the view right now is the geologic history of this peak. It includes deep metamorphic roots, explosive volcanism, dinosaur age sandstones, and glacial carving. So let's jump in. The core of the Hans Peak area starts with a Precambrian metamorphic complex, consisting mainly of a quartz feldspar biotite gneiss intercalated with amphibolite and mica schist. Mm. I know some of these words. These metamorphic rocks formed between 1.4 and 1.7 billion years ago and represent deep crustal material formed in ancient mountain building events. At the very end of the Precambrian, we also saw intrusive magmatism in the area, not as representative in Hans Peak itself, but certainly in northern Colorado. You see intrusive igneous rocks in the form of dikes or uh, pegmatites. These are usually coarse-grained igneous rocks representing magmatism happening before the Rocky Mountains even formed. These metamorphic rocks are what we would consider the basement rock here. It's what everything else is laying on. And over time, they eroded. There's actually a huge unconformity in this area, representing over a billion years of missing geologic time where either there was erosion happening and or there just wasn't deposition of other rocks in the area. You should really be paying attention. A deer just scared the crap out of me. Hi! So now we have these basement rocks made of all of these metamorphic rocks with intrusions going through them. And a long time goes by and now we're in the Mesozoic and the environment turns to a shallow sea. Lots of water and ultimately dinosaurs. And in the shallow sea it produces a lot of different sedimentary rocks. Starting with the Dakota Formation, which is a cross-bedded sandstone and conglomerate that was deposited in coastal and delta formations. And then there's the Morrison Formation, which is famous for its dinosaur fossils. And it's made of siltstone, mudstone, and sandstone, and likely represents an environment that was rich with rivers and swamps. And then you have the Entrada sandstone in the Somerville Formation, which are a thinly bedded sandstone and shale, which were formed in desert and tidal flat environments. And then you have the Chinle Formation, which is mudstone and sandstone formed in fluvial systems. So that is a huge amount of sedimentary formation in this area that just laid on top of that, those basement rocks. You won't see any of those sedimentary layers on Hans Peak itself. There's actually a little bit of one of the formations on the north side, and it's almost bleached white. When you look at it, you probably want the sandstone because it's actually been hydrothermally altered. But even though they're not on Hans Peak itself, it is cool to think about this area once hosting dinosaurs and Jurassic life. I mean, I could be hanging out with a dinosaur on this hike right now if only I was in the right geologic era. And this is where the story explodes, quite literally, because Hans Peak is the core of a tertiary aged stratovolcano. And it was formed in the Oligocene about 28 to 30 million years ago. During this time, widespread volcanism occurred all across Colorado and is tied to crustal extension following the Laramide orogeny, which sounds spicy, but is really just a fancy way of saying mountain building events. Hans Peak itself actually erupted some pyroclastic flows. You can actually see some of these. <laughs> Or maybe, can you? Can you see it? I don't think so. Hold on, let me find a better one. And this is my favorite part of the geologic history of this area, is the fact that there were these magmatic bodies at this point in geologic time that were just underground and wanted to get out so bad, but there is this pesky overlying bedrock on top of it. And it said, I don't care. And it absolutely annihilated the overlying bedrock, creating these really cool volcanic breaches. And in some cases, blocks of this overlying material were actually broken up and ejected, but intact creating block and ash flows. And oddly enough, where Hans Peak comes in in geologic history is also where Joseph Hans comes in in people history. <laughs> um, he, in the late 19th century, uh, was actually a German immigrant who was the first person to write about the geologic observations in the area and actually identified placer deposits of gold 
not far from where I'm standing actually. And the gold was actually a product of this volcanism at this time. Rivers and streams would erode volcanic veins carrying gold and would deposit flakes and nuggets in stream beds and in rivers. The mining in the area was short-lived and the plastic deposits quickly dried up. There just wasn't that much gold to mine. Um, but it did spark a lot of interest uh, for white settlers in the area and ultimately gave Hans Peak its name thanks to Joseph Hans himself. I'm so glad that I came here on the windiest day possible to record this for you guys. <laughs> After the volcanism waned, you actually started seeing a lot of erosion which wore down the landscape. And in the Miocene and Pliocene, you started seeing valleys, especially around places like Steamboat Lake, being formed and then deposited with the Browns Park formation which is actually almost a, a tophaceous sandstone um, or siltstone that is a sedimentary rock made of the volcanic materials that were sourced eons before. And these were largely deposited both by rivers and by wind. What really gets me is that the Browns Park Formation actually, if you look at it, looks like a volcanic rock because the uh, fine grain matrix that's cementing all the grains together is made of volcanic ash. So kudos to the geologists that actually mapped the area originally and determined that it was in fact not a volcanic rock but a sedimentary rock made of volcanic material. Way back when I was a field geologist we would call that a sandesite because <laughs> is it sandstone or andesite? It's hard to tell. And one last thing about Browns Park formation, it's actually fossiliferous, which is a not only a fun word to say, but it actually contains mammalian fossils, like from horses, camels, and rhinos. And then we get into the Pleistocene, which is when we see Ice Age glacial formations carving deep U-shaped valleys. Some sources say you don't really see any glacial carving on Hans Peak itself. You actually see it more to the east, closer to the Continental Divide. Some sources actually say that ice sheets, ice sheets, hard to say, uh, carved what is now Steamboat Lake. And there is a lot of evidence of glacial till in the area. And glacial till combined with volcanic material makes for really rich soils. And while there isn't a ton of farming in the area, you do see farms planting and harvesting hay. After glaciers receded and we get to more modern day time frames, you continue to see alluvial and colluvial processes forming and shaping the landscape that we see. In fact, about 35% of the map area of the Hans Peak Quadrangle is alluvium and colluvium. All those yellow units. That means that every time there's a rainstorm or snow melts from the winter and is added to rivers in the area, we're seeing erosion of tiny little bits of material over time and that adds up. What's coolest to me is that this is a beautiful view and it's a really cool mountain to look at, but we just talked about over almost 2 billion years of geologic history, which included miners, camels, and dinosaurs, and explosive volcanism. So one little mountain can have such a cool, rich past that is really worth looking into. I'm the Cosmic Geologist, and if you like stories like these, hit that subscribe button and drop a question in the comments. And remember to stay curious because mountain views like these have really cool stories to tell.